And the colleagues at the Institute want to know, what is the intellectual provenance? Is there anything to this thing, empathy? Or is it just, so to speak, another kumbaya moment, right? Is, is it mysticism? And the word goes out, we need a token graduate student to do research in the intellectual provenance of the distinction, the concept empathy. And Tulman, Professor Tulman says to me, Lou, how about it? So I say, I'm in with both feet. Right? And it's a dissertation. It's an interesting, engaging topic. I mean, usually, many dissertations are how many distinctions can I get to dance on the head of a pin. And there's nothing wrong with them. That's like, you know, great work and important work. And here I've got some, so that gets me, you know, that, I write a dissertation in the philosophy department, empathy and interpretation. At that time, mirror neurons, which weren't invented until even 1995, don't, nobody has a clue. I'm, I'm making, does it even exist? You know how philosophers are very skeptical about everything, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I, you know, I'm trying to prove that it exists. I'm marshalling examples, uh, uh, contagious laughter, um, and, and, and the like, to prove that there is this thing of communicability of ethic. And so the work gets going. I teach for a few years. I'm like a starving scholar with four part-time jobs. I get an insurance company to train me in computing, because I have it in my 28-year-old brain that I would have more success with women if I had more money. <laughs> and there is some truth to that, you know, though not in the way that my 28-year-old, I was single at the time, uh, not in the way my 28-year-old brain uh, imagined. And so fast forward, I have a career in business and computing, and in roughly 2008, IBM eliminates my job. And I say, hooray! And I write those three books on empathy since 2010. Empathy in the Context of Philosophy, A Rumor of Empathy. And uh, the project is to expand empathy in the community, to make empathy present. And part of that, we're going to actually define our terms, say what the heck we're talking about. So that's how this work got started. Second point I would like to consider is, it does actually happen to be Bastille Day. It is Quatorze Juillet, I mean July 14th, 2016. We'll put that on the tape as well, just as a timestamp. And, you know, at first I thought that was just a lucky accident, because Bastille Day is a good party, it's the French Independence Day, but there actually is a connection. And this is it. And when people, all kinds of people, human beings, when people don't get the empathy they feel they deserve, when people don't get the respect they feel they deserve, when people don't get the dignity they feel they deserve, people get enraged. Narcissistic slights. This was Kohut's work. I mentioned Kohut. He puts empathy on the map. Lou, is there any intellectual providence? I opened this book, right, The Analysis of the Self, and it's like dealing with narcissistic rage. Uh, I mean, it's abroad in the land. Now, it's not the only variable, ladies and gentlemen. Make no mistake. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. And I'm, strictly speaking, talking only, assuming that everybody is not armed, you know, we're, on, we're not, uh, we're unarmed. But nevertheless, the Bastille Day event was one of, a, a day of rage, in effect. You know, without going into all of the details, the storming of the Bastille, this old prison in Paris, the revolution, the French Revolution was just getting going. The king was empowering various of the demographic groups to have a say in the governance of the country. It's complicated, we're not going to go there. Nevertheless, narcissistic rage, wherever there is empathy, beware. Heads up. Take care. Can rage be far behind? Why? Because my empathy, your empathy is imperfect. It's going to, I mean, we're, we're going to give ourselves permission to be human beings, right? And at some point, the empathy is going to break down. At some point, in spite of my good intentions, in spite of my commitments, in spite of my training and experience and our, our relationship or lack thereof, there's going to be a failure. And hopefully it's rather more of a manageable than, rather than a traumatic failure. 
But the, so that's the connection. Now, the, the, the challenging thing is what to do about it. How does one, you know, once again, how does one get the other person to calm down? A lot of people come into whatever it is they're coming into, including, I think probably less so when they sign up for classes, but a lot of people come into psychotherapy, a lot of people come in to see lawyers, a lot of people come in to see government organizations that are going to provide them with some service or other, and they're already angry. They're already, I mean, I mean to, be, to be straight, they're already just waiting. And it doesn't mean that they express that. It doesn't mean it gets expressed. It just means that they're simmering. And, you know, it makes one thing. So that's what it has to do with Bastille Day. Now, we're not actually going to do a drill down on the French Revolution. Uh, the commitment is to look at the secret underground history of empathy. And um, so we're going to define our terms up front. And, um, what, and so then I'll say a little bit more about the secret underground history. And I, the definition is on the handout. So you have it on the handout. And um, we're going to define our terms. And so this, I claim, I mean, I assert that this definition is an original synthesis of existing ideas. There's not a lot that's like totally, completely original in this definition. But it, if you look at each of the four parts, which we're going to look at briefly, and then follow them through aspects of the history of philosophy, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, no one would think of that Kant is a empathy scholar. It's not, it's, that's not intuitive. Uh, nevertheless, uh, and, and if we can, we're going to get to Lips and Freud and some of the phenomenologists. Uh, um, and so, so here's a definition. And I, I want to say up front, this is not necessarily the truth with a capital T, uh, but consider the possibility. I argue for this, and I believe in it, I assert it, okay? Um, and I allow for the possibility that reasonable people may disagree. So the, basically, here's what I get in being empathic. I'm open to the other person. Openness to the other person. I call this receptivity. That's borrowed from Immanuel Kant. He's got receptivity and understanding. But uh, that was the result of my PhD dissertation right there. So, okay. Yeah. The rest of it is, is, is additional. So, I'm open to the other person in so far as the other it provides me with animate expressions of life. Not only expressions of emotion, but it, it's sensations thoughts, we're human beings, we've got language, it's highly linguistically wrappered, but not only language, right? I mean, it's not only language. There is a whole conversation about body language, which is abroad in the land, and which we're going to wrap up in here. And this is where the, the top bubble, under empathic receptivity, so there are going to be four aspects of empathy. Empathic receptivity, empathic understanding, empathic interpretation, and empathic responsiveness, or speech, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to say a little bit about, and then about each of them, and then we're going to like drill down into how these show up in the philosophy of David Hume, in Kant, and in a couple of other thinkers, if we can get to it. Uh, so um, I'm open to the other person. And if I, what's, what's interesting about this definition is each of the four aspects of empathy exist simultaneously and in a single moment I can consider them sequentially and if empathy breaks down at each of them I get a distinctive breakdown I get a distinctive description of something going wrong so if my empathic receptivity breaks down I get emotional contagion as in a crowd where panic sweeps through a crowd, where enthusiasm sweeps through a crowd, and the people in the crowd don't understand where the feeling is coming from. Each of them individually believes they're possessed by this emotion, this passion, this affect, this feeling. And it, you know, it's, if you stop there, 
you get emotional contagion. And, uh, it, and to get further with empathy, it ha the affect has to be further processed. I suggest it cognitively processed. We, we have to do something like thinking. Uh, well, and we can say a little bit more about that, right? We're going to bring in some, some aspect of understanding. And I was talking with a number of you beforehand, and one of the gentlemen noted that, uh, that the blurb announcing this talk mentioned Heidegger, right? I mean, and, and each of these actually maps to one of Heidegger's four distinctions, those of you who are <clears throat> Heidegger scholars out there. Uh, <laughs> um, there's, uh, in effect, affectivity, uh, understanding by which we understand understanding of possibility, what is possible for a human being. And uh, if that breaks down, then I get, uh, in effect, I get stuckness. I get stereotyping. I think of people as, stere I get a certain kind of labeling and categorization as opposed to what is possible for a human being. So in empathy, I'm relating to another human being as who they are as a possibility. And then I take that possibility. So, for example, uh, my mother shows up as a difficult individual, right? But what about the possibility that this is somebody who just has a different way of showing their love, of showing their affection. In other words, shifting the possibility, right? I mean, if uh, this is easier said than done. Um, and within that possibility, then I further unpack that and drill down to empathic interpretation. And this is where folk psychology, right? Folk psychology comes up. If we were to to do uh, some folk psychology, empathy is understood as walking in another person's shoes, right? taking the perspective of another person. What's not left very clear or well clarified with that folk psychology, am I using their feet or my feet? Right? Because if I'm using my feet, am I really understanding them? No, the suggestion is I'm really not getting where they're at. And so it's necessary to have some understanding of who they are and what their character is and what size shoe they have so I can get some sense, if you will, of where the shoe pinches and shapes. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the good part, so to speak, in terms of understanding who they are and where they're coming from. Uh, and so empathy is both bottom-up, where I have an experience of what you're experiencing. And top down, I may cognitively process what I'm getting bottom up uh, by thinking about what's the perspective, first person, second person, third person, all three. We, can, we need to mar marshal them all. And what's this motion here? Rotate through them, process through them, move through them respectively. At which point, I can be perfectly empathic with you on a good day without necessarily your knowing it. That's incomplete. There's something incomplete there, right? I mean, to have a relationship, to have relatedness, empathic relatedness, it may be useful to respond, to, to show the other person what I get from what they're dealing with and how, how my understanding lives in that relationship, right? And so that gives us the fourth in effect, I say up there, right, What's, you know, if your life, if my life were a movie, what would that be like? I'm inside the movie of your life. I have a bit part and I'm observing. Or I have a major part. Now, that's, I suggest that the point to be taken there is that empathy requires a vicarious experience. Key term vicarious experience. That's what I get in the theater, right? That's what I get in, a in the movies. I have a sense of what the other person up on the stage is going through, but I don't necessarily, right, there's a joke how the peasant who wasn't familiar, the farm boy or girl who wasn't familiar with the conventions of the theater, the villain 
is tying innocent Nell to the railroad track, right? The train is coming down the track. The, the, the person who doesn't get the conventions of the, of the theater jumps up on the stage to rescue Nell. No, you don't get it. That's not it. What you're supposed to get is a vicarious experience, a participation which leaves you, which moves you, which maybe even shakes you, but doesn't require, doesn't, is in effect, does, pro, may actually prohibit involvement. Which brings me to um, the next important point that I want to make. I did some survey research, right, because we're like hinting at the distinction between a vicarious experience of your experience and getting involved and compassion. And if you will, in modern day parlance, we're going to debate the meaning of sympathy and empathy now and ongoing, right? I mean, we're going to say a lot more about that momentarily. Nevertheless, I did a survey. So I said I had a class, 15 people. Go out, ask five people, not members of your family, people you know but don't know them very well. And don't tell them. Don't tell them what you think empathy is. Don't give them a definition, right? Don't give them, and ask them what they think empathy is. Ask them, what do you think empathy is? And, you know, see if you can get an answer, right? Have them tell a story and, and bring back the result, right? Bring back the data. That counts as data. So here's the trend. There was actually a trend. Most people regard empathy as compassion. They will tell a story about altruism, being nice, being helpful, being, and heavens knows, ladies and gentlemen, the world needs more compassion. The world requires, needs, it, it greatly needs more al altruism. It is distinct from empathy. Empathy and compassion are distinct. Empathy tells me, so I assert, once again, not the truth with a capital T, but consider the possibility, right? And there are debates about this in the literature, covering, covering the debates. Um, Batson represents the pro-social aspect. Empathy is at the foundation of compassion. So he doesn't say they're the same, but he drills down. Uh, over here, Simon Baron Cohen, zero degrees of empathy. The conversation about the psychopath, the sociopath. The individuals on the Asperger's autistic scale who seem to lack getting that the other is minded, who seem to lack either a conscience and or an ability to feel what the other is feeling in the way that they feel it so that one could appreciate there's another human being of it. So that, I mean, the debate is joined, right? We're not going to actually end that debate today. But I call, I call out the the spectrum. I'm taking a position on that. So this is a, a position. This is in effect a thesis. That empathy tells me, <coughs> empathy tells you what the other person is experiencing. Altruism and ethics tell us what to do about it. So there's a distinction there. And then further, further development out of that. That's actually, that would not, not everybody would agree with that. I want to call that out. You know, there would, others would say that, you know, really you're missing the point, and others would say. So there's a, there's a conversation about that, but that's like right up front and one of the major issues. And so now, having laid out a field of distinctions, we're going to get to the heart of the matter, of the secret underground history of empathy. So we've got four aspects of empathy a receptivity, an understanding of possibility. I, I, when, when interpretation breaks down, what happens then? Well, actually, I've got a slide on that, so I think we're going to actually advance the slide. Ah, yes, here we go. Isn't that useful? When empathy, when receptivity breaks down, we get emotional contagion. I'm caught up, I'm, I'm panicking, but I don't know why. I'm catching your contagious panic. I'm catching your angst. Uh, when empathy breaks down, we get the fundamental attribution error. What that is to say, projection. I attribute to you my issues. They're coming at me from the whole world, right? I mean, that 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 is known to be known to happen. And labeling and categorization. Uh, when when empathic interpretation breaks down, I take things out of context. I I don't get the right perspective. I'm second guessing. Uh, in effect, uncharitable, I am uncharitable in a technical sense. Not that I don't give money to Amnesty International or the local uh, food shelter, right? 
No, I mean uncharitable in that I willfully misinterpret what people are saying in line with my own stuff, right? So that's uncharitable uh, in that sense. A, a man named uh, Donald Davidson said, when we interpret the works of others, we should try to be, we should be charitable and understand what they're saying as they would understand it themselves. Don't change meanings if, you know, I mean, of course, misunderstandings have inevitably occurred. But uh, we want to also be charitable. And then finally, empathic <coughs> responsiveness, that's a form of speech, oftentimes storytelling narrative. And here, when that breaks down, you get gossip. In effect, in, inauthentic forms of speech. We were talking earlier about have we lost inauthenticity? And inauthenticity, here's the thing. Inauthenticity is, is not necessarily designed into us as human beings. We're designed, I, once again, consider the possibility. We're designed to survive. We do what we need to do to survive. And sometimes that is inconsistent with flourishing with flourishing as an individual, or flourishing as a community. I'm, I'm selfish. Think of narrow self-love, right? That doesn't contribute to community. Sometimes it's self-defeating. Frequently it is. Works for a while. But inevitably, there's the, the moment where it stops working, and you find out that what goes around, it's the hermeneutic circle in a different sense, what goes around comes around. So uh, blaming, finger pointing, making wrong, when it breaks. So this is what's interesting about this definition of empathy. And yes, it is, Kohat said, empathy is vicarious introspection. That belongs up in the receptivity part. I have a vicarious experience of what you're experiencing. Um, um, other, I mean, and, and, then, and then those who take the top down, put yourself in the other person's shoes, uh, end up in the empathic interpretation perspective. Okay, so, so we're going to take these four distinctions, and I, can, I suggest that this shows up all at once and for didactic purposes, for purposes of a conversation, for purposes of disentangling and engaging, getting access to empathy, for purposes of getting access to empathy. It's useful to bring these distinctions and others that line up with them or don't to the subject matter. And because you, you, you find the debates in the, mar in the market, if you will, in the academic intellectual market, are between those who think it's bottom up and those who think it's top down. And there has emerged a whole group who say, well, you need both. Got to agree with that. And then there are a couple of other aspects around interpretation that loom large are, and are in the foreground. So with that definition in mind, let's turn to the secret underground history of empathy. The first we had, I said, am I getting this right? Yes, John. John. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, guy, please. Just going back to what you just said when you mentioned top down or bottom up, are you talking about uh, innate versus learned, a posterior? I will repeat the question because we're actually, for instructional purposes, recording it. The question is, in talking about top down versus bottom up, am I talking about the distinction innate versus learned? Now, the short answer is no. Uh, but that, that, that's a valid question. Uh, I, I mean, um, we bring, you know, so let's consider that. I mean, both top down and bottom up are both innate and learned. We've now got a two by two matrix. I think that's very interesting. That's very, and we bring something to the game. A number, in conversations before class, I was talking with people, uh, you came in just on time, which is uh, fine, of course. Um, and people say, well, you know, I want to teach it. One of, the, one of the participants is in a high school and they do work in the community and some of the kids get something like empathy and for others it's a higher bar, right? I mean, and, you know, one other individual raised a couple of daughters and the one daughter seemed to be very empathic and the other one who had the benefit of what the, the parent learned was like struggling with some things around that, right? I mean, so... The suggestion is, we bring something to the game. I am, you know, I am committed to the possibility of teaching empathy. Now, what that looks like is an interesting, interesting thing, right? That's not, I mean, that's going to come up, and I want to come back to that. But we, you know, there are a few outliers. There may very well be, and I mentioned diseases, or I should say, disorders of empathy. 
psychopathy, sociopathy, people who are on some description of an Asperger's or autism spectrum where they're seen. Simon Baron Cohen has done, it, it, you know, we pause for a moment to honor his work uh, on mind blindness who seem to not get that other people are a, so, a source of intentionality and mindedness like my own. We're going to do, I mean, this is where you really need to sign up for the seven session course beginning Tuesday, September 27th at 6 p.m. How am I doing there, uh, Fred? Uh, uh, but I have the, uh, I think we handed that up. But uh, anyway, um, the false belief test where, you know, if, if I'm three years old, I'll fail this test. I can't put myself in the other person's position and realize where. Susie Ann hid the candy. I'm not doing, we're not doing that experiment right now. Whereas two years later, I inevitably know to shift perspective from the person hiding the candy to the person who came, left the room and came back in the room. So, you know, stuff develops. Stuff that is our empathic capabilities, our, including our cognitive capabilities. And the debates around, well, maybe I just need more language. Once I get language, I can then make these shifts and then language is sometimes insufficient in itself. So, right, these are the terms of the debates. I mean, so thank you. I mean, it's a really, you know, a, a, a good, a good yeah, question. By saying but now a couple of again. things about how all of this work on empathy got started. I'm a graduate student at the University of Chicago. I, after being an undergraduate, did my major in philosophy, read a lot of Immanuel Kant, and then I end up a graduate student and one of my dissertation advisors, this is a matter of public record, so there's nothing particularly confidential about this, a man named Stephen Toolman, who in his time was something of a celebrity academic. His book, Wittgenstein's Vienna, gets reviewed in the New York Times Book Review. He's a, he's a, a mover and shaker, if you will. He comes to Chicago and is being psychoanalyzed by the colleagues at the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis. And at the same time, simultaneously, a man named Heinz Kohut, he is a doctor, medical doctor, an escapee from Vienna, gets not exactly the last train out of town, but just about, uh, and uh, is innovating in the matter of empathy. He writes an article in the way back. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I wasn't around in, actually, 1959, introspection, empathy, and uh, psychoanalysis. And he's in 1971, the analysis of the self, he's saying empathy, empathy, empathy. And the colleagues at the Institute want to know, what is the intellectual provenance? Is there anything to this thing, empathy? Or is it just, so to speak, another kumbaya moment, right? Is, is it mysticism? And the word goes out, we need a token graduate student to do research in the intellectual provenance of the distinction, the concept empathy. And Tulman, Professor Tulman says to me, Lou, how about it? So I say, I'm in with both feet. Right? And it's a dissertation. It's an interesting, engaging topic. I mean, usually, many dissertations are how many distinctions can I get to dance on the head of a pin? And there's nothing wrong with them. That's like, you know, great work and important work. And here I've got some, so that gets me, you know, that, I write a dissertation in the philosophy department, empathy and interpretation. At that time, mirror neurons, which weren't invented until even 1995, don't, nobody has a clue. I'm, I'm making, does it even exist? You know how philosophers are very skeptical about everything, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I, you know, I'm trying to prove that it exists. I'm marshalling examples, uh, uh, contagious laughter, um, and, and, and the like, to prove that there is this thing of communicability of ethic. And so the work gets going. I teach for a few years. I'm like a starving scholar with four part-time jobs. I get an insurance company to train me in computing, because I have it in my 28-year-old brain that I would have more success with women if I had more money. <laughs> and there is some truth to that, you know, though not in the way that my 28-year-old, I was single at the time, uh, not in the way my 28-year-old brain uh, imagined. And so fast forward, I have a career in business and computing, and in roughly 2008, IBM eliminates my job. And I say, hooray! And I write those three books on empathy since 2010. Empathy in the Context of Philosophy, A Rumor of Empathy. 
And uh, the project is to expand empathy in the community, to make empathy present. And part of that, we're going to actually define our terms, say what the heck we're talking about. So that's how this work got started. Second point I would like to consider is it does actually happen to be Bastille Day. It is Quatorze Juillet, I mean July 14th, 2016. We'll put that on the tape as well, just as a timestamp. And, you know, at first I thought that was just a lucky accident, because Bastille Day is a good party, it's the French Independence Day, but there actually is a connection. And this is it. And when people, all kinds of people, human beings, when people don't get the empathy they feel they deserve, when people don't get the respect they feel they deserve, when people don't get the dignity they feel they deserve, people get enraged. Narcissistic slights. This was Cohut's work. I mentioned Cohut. He puts empathy on the map. Lou is there in the intellectual providence. I opened this book, right, uh, The Analysis of the Self, and it's like dealing with narcissistic rage. Uh, I mean, it's abroad in the land. Now, it's not the only variable, ladies and gentlemen. Make no mistake. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. And I'm, strictly speaking, talking only assuming that everybody is not armed, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not armed. But nevertheless, the Bastille Day event was one of a, a day of rage, in effect. You know, without going into all of the details, the storming of the Bastille, this old prison in Paris, the revolution, the French Revolution was just getting going. The king was empowering various of the demographic groups to have a say in the governance of the country. It's complicated. We're not going to go there. Nevertheless, narcissistic rage, wherever there is empathy, beware. Heads up. Take care. Can rage be far behind? Why? Because my empathy, your empathy, is imperfect. It's going to, I mean, we're, we're going to give ourselves permission to be human beings, right? And at some point, the empathy is going to break down. At some point, in spite of my good intentions, in spite of my commitments, in spite of my training and experience and our, our relationship or lack thereof, there's going to be a failure. And hopefully it's rather more of a manageable than, rather than a traumatic failure. But the, so that's the connection. Now, the, the, the challenging thing is what to do about it. How does one, you know, once again, how does one get the other person to calm down? A lot of people come into whatever it is they're coming into, including, I think probably less so when they sign up for classes, but a lot of people come into psychotherapy, a lot of people come in to see lawyers, a lot of people come in to see government organizations that are going to provide them with some service or other, and they're already angry. They're already, I mean, I mean to be to be straight, they're already just waiting. And it doesn't mean that they express that. It doesn't mean it gets expressed. It just means that they're simmering. And, you know, it makes one thing. So that's what it has to do with Bastille Day. Now, we're not actually going to do a drill down on the French Revolution. Uh, the commitment is to look at the secret underground history of empathy. And, uh, but now, once again, I'm going to take the step, the bold step back. 1739. David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment, right? I mean, Adam Smith is up there in Edinburgh. I, I, I can't do a Scottish brogue. I wish it would be perfect. But I mean, Adam Smith, not 1776, uh, the wealth of nations, right? I mean, we pause for a moment for that too. This is not that one. This is 1739. David Hume, a treatise of human nature. A Treatise of Human Nature. Now, this is 600 pages. Uh, you know, we're not going to, we're going to, at most, read 30 pages a week, you know. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, Hume, never much of a stickler for consistency, has four different definitions of sympathy in the treatise and in his 17 51, Inquiry into Moral Sentiments, and in his little essay, A Delicacy of Taste. He has at least four different definitions. The word empathy in the English language is not invented until 1890. 
a man named Edward Bradford Titchener, psychologist, Cornell University, is translating the works of Wilhelm Wundt. We pause for a moment for that, him too. But a very short moment, because nothing he wrote was ever stunning. <laughs> is still of much significance. Other than whenever Freud wanted to shoot somebody down, he chose Wundt. And it always worked, by the way. Um, nevertheless, the man was voluminous and used the word. And so, but he created the discipline of psychology. Every year in Leipzig, he had a psychology laboratory. He was not a biologist. That's the thing. Helmholtz, you know, a lot of, I mean, truly a genius. His, his theory of vision is probably still valid with a few little tweaks around the end. No, uh, Wundt is purely a psychologist. We don't need to look at the biology. So the psychologists honor him, and we honor him for that. Anyway, Titchener is translating Wundt, and he invents the word empathy. It doesn't mean, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't mean that it didn't exist before that. It means that there was no specific word in the English language. In German, there was Einfühlung. Einfühlung, feeling one's way into. This is where I could, you know, just for those of you who are curious about that sort of thing. Uh, and that occurs in Novalis. It, it occurs in Herder as well with the umlaut. Uh, and, uh, and then it really gets going uh, in around 1890. But in Hume, we have at least four different definitions of sympathy. And I'm about, we're about to look at them because they map. In inter they don't, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. That, wouldn't that be nice, right? It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. But it's pretty darn close. So um, basically, Hume says um, that when I come into a room with a lot of happy people, I get happy. I mean, he says it in his fancy English. And, and when I'm with somebody who's down in the dumps, how could it not affect me? It does. Emotional contagion. The communicability of affect. I pick up the feelings of other people. We pick up one another's feelings. Now it may be subtle, and we may have to actually practice not to do so. Because I'm in an office working with people and we got to update the spreadsheet or do whatever we're doing, right? I mean, this is called survival, right? There's the survival dimension. And Evans knows, I mean, it's a different world that we have today from even that in which Hume lived. Um, but we, you know, so our historic empathy is challenged. I mean, this was, well, I mean, we can, we can reflect on that at some moment, but unfortunately not for too long um, today. But so, and he's so, first, right off the bat, um, there's, and he talks about the theater. He's a big fan of the theater. And he talked, and his point, I mean, so why is he doing this? Because he has a very simple theory of knowledge consisting of ideas and impressions. So if you were to take philosophy 101, you get to say, I'm not sending you off to read Hume, but he has a, a really powerful and simple theory of knowledge consisting of impressions and ideas. So I get, so my, my experience, my five senses, give me impressions of the world, right? I then abstract. So I meet five different dogs, Charlie, Rover, Fido, Nietzsche, uh, and Kant, right? We're now naming our dogs after philosophers. Um, and I abstract the idea of a dog, you know, it's got to have a tail, whatever, you'll do the drill. It, it actually is man's best friend in some ways. I mean, you know, people, dogs have bonded with human beings. That some, seems to be pretty essential. Um, and we have a relationship, you know, we have a relationship. Anyway, so, uh, what the, the, so, when we, under, so according to Hume, when we understand something, we take our impressions, and we build ideas. When we sympathize, we take an idea and generate an impression. That's the vicarious experience. So I have a slide for that too. This was going to be, this will be useful. That's a quote which we're not going to do. So here we have a picture of somebody who's angry. According to Hume, I get an impression, right, of that anger. There's the boss blowing his stack. I get an impression. Now there's somebody's head. There's a picture of a head. And I get, I, I get an idea of anger. So that's understanding. Now sympathy consists of taking that idea and generating from it an impression of anger. That's why I feel your anger, arguably. 
Right? I mean, this, so uh, they're number one and number two. Uh, understanding converts impressions to ideas. Sympathy converts ideas to impressions. That's about three weeks of philosophy right there. <laughs> okay? So you can take that to the bank. Now, it's not, now that doesn't give me full-blown human empathy. That gives me a kind of emotional contagion. That gives me the power of suggestion, right? Which is closely related to empathy, but it is a misunderstanding if you stop there. You're not going to get, you're not going to be understood if you stop there. You're going to be trying, you get credit for starting, you get credit, right? Uh, and so, Hume gets it though, he says, to have full-blown empathy, I need to bring to my impressions and my ideas and the dynamic around converting them back and forth. I need to bring the idea of the other, the other person, the other individual. So I, in effect, get a double representation, a double idea. I get the idea, in this case, to keep us, this is a simple mind, I get the idea of the anger and that my vicarious experience of anger is coming from you. It's coming from an other. It's not endogenous. Now, how do I tell the difference? How would you know? Right? That, if it breaks down at that point, we could get projection. If it breaks down at that point, we could get taking the other person's point of view and not getting it right. So, how do you do that? Well, it requires work. It requires practice. This is where people, like, train. This is training. Can improve this distinction, this ability to say, I introspect about what my day was about and why I'm really pissed at the boss who didn't recognize me for my enormous contribution. Well, you know, insert your narrative of choice, ladies and gentlemen, right? And, and you reflect on that and you work with that. And then you get to see, well, now maybe, you know, is am I feeling anxious because I really am anxious? And I'm like, who is this guy? And what am I, can I relate to them or not? Or is it, am I really picking that up? And then, so there's a conversation there, right? And, and so that's actually, um, depicted, I want to say here, we have to bring in the idea of the other. And that gives me a double representation. And in addition to that, Hume, Hume, so Hume is exploring what is human nature, and part of any philosophical project is to provide a foundation for theory of knowledge, to provide a foundation for ethics, to, to know the difference between right and wrong. And Hume is very interested and committed to making sympathy and what he calls the passions, the strong passions and the calm passions. So that's almost like a jumbo shrimp, a calm passion. But it would be, but, but it makes sense in his day. The language itself has shifted significantly. We understand passion to be passion and to involve energy and maybe even libido in that. And nevertheless, for him, it, it involves, it may be a calm passion, so enjoying a sunset. But, um, but the, the secret under, there's another dimension that requires taking a step back. Uh, and it's almost impossible, it's very challenging for us to get this today in our, in our sensibility, in our modern... Um, for Hume, the imagination was the source of sympathy and also the source of the appreciation of art and beauty. And you could see how that would work. The imagination is converting ideas to impressions, impressions back to ideas. That's a function of the imagination. And the imagination is also a critical path in appreciating beautiful art and beautiful nature. There, it's a more subtle dy dynamic, I'm not even sure. But nevertheless, uh, for Hume, he I hesitate because it, it's so important and so really sometimes hard to get. Hume has an idea of what he calls a delicacy of taste, and it is distinct from a delicacy of passion. And in both cases, he tells a story, so maybe the best thing to do is to tell a story. And we'll then read back into it the distinction he's kind of, because it's like critical path for our understanding of empathy today. It really blows the conversation wide open. So he's talking about he's talking about aesthetic taste, appreciation of art, appreciation of beauty. But he's also taste is a metaphor, right? Wine tasting. We actually will do a little bit of that in about uh, ten minutes or so. So caraggio to, for those of you. Um, 
Uh, and uh, so he, so there's some wine tasters. So he's talking about how do we make a judgment? How do we make a judgment that something is superior to something else in the matter of taste? Because it's no art is notoriously subjective. One one person finds something beautiful, another person finds it less beautiful, a third person finds it uh, runs screaming from the room. I exaggerate there just slightly. So he gives this example. There are there's a cask of sherry and several wine experts. So the wine experts are tasting it. And the one guy drinks a taste and says, this is a fine sherry, except it has a little taste of iron. Iron, F-E, right? And the other guy tastes it, and he says, it's a, I agree, it's a fine sherry, except it has a strange little taste of leather. And the other experts taste it, and they don't get that, and they make fun of them. They mock them. Right, so they do their job and drink all the sherry. Get, right? They get to the bottom, and there is a rusty key on a leather thong, right? A little like a key, chip, a key thing. A delicacy of taste. Those two experts had a delicacy of taste, literally, where the other, they were aware of an impression. It works for a theory of I, they had an impression that the other experts didn't have. Now, Shift this to empathy. If you are aware of another person's ambivalence, of they seem to be angry, but they're really sad. They seem to be sad, but they're really something else. They're really angry. Right? If you're aware of something that I am not aware of, we might say, we might argue, that your delicacy of empathy is superior to mine. Now the thinker in modern times, I'm talking 1980s, 1990s, relatively modern, we uh, really a, a, a phenomenal contribution, Paul Ekman, E-K-M-A-N, uh, has a facial coding scheme. So he, his side, he spent seven years coding all the muscles in the face. There are 30 muscles in the face. A lot of research. He says, no, but you would be insane to do that today. <laughs> Nevertheless, he does that. It's now being automated in software. Interesting what's going on there. Nevertheless, um, we are, the, the face is an emotional hotspot. There are muscles in our face that we cannot control. So I've got a little slide for that as well. Uh, we're going to fast forward. Some great quotes. Now, you can't really see that very well, but I'll make my point anyway. Maybe we don't really need to turn off the lights. We're just going to fake it. Um, one is a false smile, and one, one is the false smile where I, the guy's showing his teeth. That's Paul Ekman, by the way, the scientist. He's, you know, I show my teeth, right? Uh, but to an authentic smile, a so called Duchesne smile, because Professor Duchesne was the guy who identified. We've got smile lines around our eyes. The best way to evoke them is to think happy thoughts. Right? I mean, that's the only way to evoke them. To way, the best way to fake an emotion is to really experience it. We pause to acknowledge, a paradox, right? We pause to acknowledge that great psychologist, Konstantin Stanislavski, the mem me emotional memory. Right? I mean, now, there are other ways. So, you can see why large lawn, now, this is a digression, but I think it's one. Get, Ekman gets his name on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, um, and this is years, because large law enforcement organizations in the United States want to talk to him. You see why. Because the contempt for the capitalist system, right? So, the would-be suicide bomber presents a happy face, but the contempt for the running dogs of capitalism leaks out in now it's, it's not you know that's what that's the interest that's a story and, and to Ackman's credit he he said he refused to do with the then Soviet Union he wouldn't train the KGB in this method it has legs it has legs and but at the point our point today is one approach to empathy one approach to empathy and what is trainable is practice distinguishing one's experiences. This is called introspection, among other things. It's called sitting down in a quiet room and thinking about one, what one has experienced, or sitting down in a noisy room and thinking about what one has experienced. It'll be a different experience, but it might be worth it as an exercise. 
So let's, let's you know, the takeaway is the definition of empathy and, and the four different aspects of empathy. And that empathy is often hidden in plain view. It is the foundation of community. This is not on the piece of paper. In many ways, empathy is being in the presence of another human being without anything else added, without any categories, without any judgments, without any evaluations, without any diagnoses, even without any philosophical arguments about ideas and impressions, without any hermeneutic circles. Empathy is being in the presence of another human being without anything else added. Now that's a high bar. And the reason why empathy one approach to training empathy, which a number of people ask, is, is this, a, is this a, you know, a pipe dream, you either got it or you don't got it. One approach to training empathy, which I think has legs, it's not the only one, you remove the resistances to empathy. Human beings are naturally empathic. And things get in the way. What things, Lou? Shame, fear, guilt. You know, my mama taught me a lot of good stuff. She was, I got a lot of empathy from her. But some of that training, you know, might need some revision, right? I mean, it, it, back, insert your parent or educator of choice. There, I, in a cynical moment, people have been known to say certain aspects of education drive the empathy out of the spontaneity, spontaneity out. But I think that's not what authentic education is about, right? In, inquiry into what's possible. But there are certain kinds of limited training, right, which, you know, it largely consists of doing what one's told, that, which has its uses on, on, a, on a good day, you know, on, a, on any given day. Nevertheless, if we remove the resistances to empathy, which include that people are difficult, right, people, these are difficult, that creates resistance. Why would I want to relate to this difficult individual, right? I mean, leave me alone, I'm going to do my thing, right, and there's nothing wrong. So if we remove the obstacles, then empathy naturally unfolds. And it looks like we've trained it. Even though, and then, then there's tips and techniques. We're not doing tips and techniques. We'll do tips and techniques afterwards. That's like, pause to listen. So I wish to express my appreciation. I'm going to declare a 10 minute break to get, so I'm going to also ask your help in opening the bottles. There are some bacon wrap dates there. I mean, you could keep that running while we put the bacon wrap dates. And some other little light snacks. Those things, you know. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Just to get up and get more of those bacon wrap dates are really splendid. Yeah. <laughs> Our compliments, you know, to the chef and to Cafe Baba Riva where they got catered, you know? Always a good time. But So you have permission to get up and get around, but we're going to, in effect, reconvene. I have not planted any questions in the audience, but a couple of uh, friends who know the area in which I am weak have come up with some devilish things. All right, great. John, the floor is yours, sir. What, it's, you know, I may have to repeat the question. I, I don't know if I'm on camera. Alice, would you be kind enough to check? Go ahead. We talked about art and aesthetics, and I was just wondering, yes. is uh, appreciation of art or uh, aesthetics generally a subcomponent of empathy? Uh, do you always have to have empathy to get to uh, the philosophy of aesthetics? Okay, so I'll repeat the question just for the viewing audience at home. Home is regarding art, appreciation of beauty, and empathy. Is art a subset of empathy, presumably, or vice versa, um, or what actually is going on there? And and the I actually have thought about that amazingly enough. Um, and here, there's an analogy. The relationship is not one. Uh, I think, I assert, right, I assert, um, this is once again not the truth with a capital T, but consider the possibility, and I would argue for this, um, that the relationship between the appreciation of the beautiful, like the work of art, the delicacy of taste, and the appreciation of another human being, being in a relationship, empathizing, is one of analogy, not of subordination or 
upper, lower, higher, or not hierarchical. The, and why? What both have in common, so there is a common root, which would be the imagination. In, in empathy, in top-down empathy, I'm imaginatively putting myself in your place as if I were over there with your, presumably with what I know of your character and your experiences and your struggles and your everything. And in the case of appreciation of art, I mean, it's pure, it can be pure, flat-out fantasy, right? Go with it, an interesting combination, what would this look like in a different light? And so the imagination is the common root. And this does, does, does give me a chance to say something about Kant, which I promised. It was the commitment and we kind of like, you know, whatever. We do what we can do, good faith, best effort. Kant, for Kant, the, in the Critique of Judgment, so this is 1790, 1793, he said he was inspired or more properly awakened, Kant said, from his dogmatic slumbers by reading David Hume. That's a famous quote. Um, and he read him in translation. Hume got translated into the comrade. I thought this guy had it together. And he, you know, he, re he disagreed with almost every result that Hume said. But nevertheless, he was inspired by it. A productive disagreement. So for Kant, the appreciation of the beauty has, of beauty has four moments. They don't map to the four parts of the definition of empathy, though it's interesting to try. For Kant, beauty is characterized by disinterestedness. There's a certain distance in the appreciation of the beautiful. Whereas, uh, like movies, going to, go to Star Wars, going to flicks, that's charming. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not, according to Kant, it's not beautiful art. And for Kant, the paradigm was nature, was beautiful nature. And, you know, painting a picture is derivative. Now, that is derivative. I mean, and, and, but for Kant, what was inspiring to the imagination, to the, to the imagination and understanding was beautiful nature. And there is a certain distance in empathy. I don't jump in and get involved like I'm going to solve your problem. There's a certain, I mean, it's not like I'm cold-hearted, but I'm engaged, but not engaged in a way like, say more about that. What do you think? You, you know, I may have an opinion, and I may even be willing to share it. Nothing wrong with that. And I'm actually going to go through the other three moments very briefly. Sure. Um, uh, and so it's a long-winded answer, but you know, it enables us to do the Kant part, which was part of the commitment. I'm excited about that. And for Kant, the, the judgment of beauty is necessary and universal. And he speaks about the communicability of affect, the communicability of feeling. It's right there, the third critique, the second moment of the judgment of the beauty. There's a communicability of feeling in the gym. My God, that is phase one. That's receptivity. It's in there. And he builds sociability on it, which for Kant is not actually a critical path for beauty. And that the judgment of beauty is necessary, but not the kind of necessity we find in the case of science or objective science. There's a, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of necessity. It's like if, if human beings were like really mensch, mensch, you know, if you were really a mensch, you would agree with me. But a compelling idea. Something like that. Something like that. And finally, there's a con, what he, Kant calls in Latin a sensus communis, but is actually a common sense which we all share. And so, and so these four elements. Uh, disinterestedness, communicability of affect, uh, necessity, and universality uh, are analogous to the analysis of empathy. So there's a rumor of empathy in Kant. And he also does talk about enlarged thinking, putting oneself in the other person's position. But that's like isolated. It doesn't get further developed. Now, John had a further follow-up, then Elizabeth, okay? No, well, at this point, I was just going to talk about that idea of beauty. It's only a compelling idea and nothing more. It's kind of a narrow view of beauty, beauty being a perfect thing or art yeah. being a perfect thing. Well, it, um, it is narrow. It is narrow. And there, I mean, there's a lot. The Kant is, is rich possibilities. For somebody who is such a formalist, I mean, and is often dismissed as being a formalist, it, and is, is complex and architectonic. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart. You know, that's in it. People often need a guide to read Kant for the first time. I know I did. And, you know, I, I benefited from it. 
So My you wanted to know also. Yes, Heidegger. You talk about Heidegger. Yeah, I did. Four distinctions, and I haven't read anything about Heidegger, but. I know Heidegger came after Kant, and so my question is, if Kant was to read Heidegger, yes. would he say about these four distinctions that they're just narrow schema yes. that we construct for ourselves yes. when we look at the world, uh, or you look know, at another? It's really such a great question, because it's entirely imaginary. And I, we were talking about that during the short break. What Kant would say is, when I'm in the, and he did say, when I'm in the presence of another human being, I'm in the presence of the moral law. Kant primarily experiences other people as an ethical imperative. Now, from th that, that's it. I mean, there's a boundary. And, you know, and then, then we insert the snarky remarks, but well justified, because Heidegger was a, not a nice person. He wrote in a, what I consider one of the great works of Western philosophy, the Being in Time, 1927, and then he joined the Nazi party. Yeah. You know. Okay. There's no point in trying to defend that, you know, we would be wasting cycles. I mean, he wrote a great book. This Nazi wrote a great book, you know. Well, okay, deal with it. I have to deal with that. I, could, I wrote a book, I wrote a book, which that gentleman has over there. Hi. Uh, you know your friends. Anyway, uh, thank you. Hold it up, hold it up. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 all right, all right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's funny. I, I will say anything for a laugh, thank you. Um, but, so, you know, the, he the Heidegger thing is difficult, because, I mean, he made an incredible contribution. And Kant would say, you know, he should have been better behaved and been more careful about who he's hanging out with. Yeah. That, that we can attribute to him. But choose your friends, why, you know, choose your... So, I mean, so, so it's an interesting... So for Kant, you know, Kant doesn't really develop the empathic dimension. It gets, it's implicit in his theory of taste. And if one wants to develop a Kantian empathy, the rumor of empathy in Kant, one has to reconstruct it based on these distinctions in his theory of aesthetics. In relating to another human being, we have a certain respect as we would for another for a work of art. There's a certain distance there. There's a certain communicability of affect. And I mean, other. I mean, it's not entirely. It's not an immoral relation. That would be insane, right? But it's not primarily ethical. I mean, don't do anything unethical. But we're relating to this, another person is struggling with their life, children, da da da, round and round, job, survival, right? I mean, there's that whole dimension. So I hope that makes some sense, but it gives you a sense of how there could be like a rumor of empathy in Kant. And then one would have to dig, and one could actually validate it. I mean, there's a rumor of empathy in Heidegger, and as a person, he does it, the rumor, it remains on invalid. It's invalidated. I, I, I think I'm going to go out on a limb. But, oh, so, uh, Elizabeth, please, I'm, I'm rambling here. Okay, my, funnily enough, even though I am raised German, I did not read Kant or Heidegger or any of those guys <laughs> in German, right? But I appreciate all the German words that find their way into philosophy, because there seems to be nothing better. <laughs> um, seems to me that basically your fourfold definition of empathy is really what you need to take away, you need to take away the dis discourses of it, the uh, where it breaks down, and then it seems to me your your impression is that it's the default. Empathy is the default. It's the Zen beginner mind. It's the Rogerian unconditional positive regard. But the rest is just taking away all the now pause mental pause so I can repeat what you said. That empathy is the default. It's the beginner's mind. It's the Rogerian, I gather, Carl Rogers, unconditional positive regard. You had the third thing in there. No, that was it. We yeah. Think, so and, really and what we're doing is getting rid of the projections, uh, the... Uh, yeah, it the emerges out of the misunderstandings right. in some ways. So where, where it breaks down, yeah. the breakdowns of it. So I would agree. I mean, thank you. That's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> well, and that's okay. Uh, sir, and then over there. Uh. Um, there are some people who think that people like serial killers and sexual predators lack a genetic capacity for empathy, um, and which means that it would not, for them in any case, it would not be the natural state. Do you know, I, I'm completely unfamiliar with any literature about that. Have you looked at the literature about in biology, about uh, whether there's any support for this hypothesis? Well, the, the short answer, so the question is, what about serial killers, psychopaths, 
What other they kind of capacity? The, the people who are seriously disturbed and run afoul of the criminal justice system as a result, or ought to, to for the safety of the rest of us, right? And it has legs. I mean, I, there's an extensive literature on it. Um, I am going to, I mean, I'm going to see if I, I wrote a, a presentation, and it has a biography, a bibliography, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to actually, but there's a great text on, in effect, uh, empathy and mental illness. There are several of them. And uh, Jean de Citi, D-E-C-E-T-Y, of the University of Chicago, he's got his MRI machine over, not, it's actually not in Gates Blake down on the campus, uh, but he's there, yeah, okay. you know, and he's a gracious man. I dropped in on him, he's very welcoming. Um, I, it's actually not in this particular bibliography, but he's done a lot of work about what causes certain areas of the brain to go off, and I mean, the short, I mean, it's like, it's fraught. The matter is fraught, of course. because the, a lot of these individuals who then perpetrate horrendous crimes, have been, uh, you know, abused, which is no excuse. They've had parenting, which is like not really parenting. They've been raised in a cage or some, you know, it's been awful. I mean, and the awfulness, unfortunately, then continues and they have to be incarcerated. Uh, for, so yes, I mean, but notice that this is the outlier, right? We're going to draw the normal curve, the normal distribution. And yes, there are some outliers, but the vast majority of human beings have some empathy. And, it, you know, the challenge then is to develop the available capacity. I mean, that's my answer for the, you know, those in high school who are studying with, struggling with, you know, the hormones are going off, and it, sometimes it seems to flood the empathic capabilities, right? These individuals are struggling. That's in itself a simplistic you know, statement to make, but it has some legs. So, yes, I mean, and so even that, I mean, so basically, I've got one more thought, and then we'll get back. A lot of what empathy is about, is limits, drawing limits and traversing a boundary between self and other, right? So, um, so I'm distinct from the other. Now, when empathy works right, there's communication across that boundary, but I remain distinct from you. When there's merger, nothing wrong with merger, but it's not empathy. That's like emotional contagion. It can feel really good, right? I mean, and I'm not saying don't do it in the privacy of your own home. Uh, right, you know, <laughs> to just stay out the CTA, uh, but uh, okay. nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, um, in, in that regard, the takeaways, it's, in some ways, it's similar to humor, which involves traversing a boundary, but getting a laugh, getting a laugh, whereas empathy is usually more significant than serious. Elizabeth, you wanted to follow I just up? wanted to sort of maybe add to this question. One thing I do remember from taking a substance abuse class is about the development of the brain and the synaptic functions that a baby up to about age of six months creates gazillion synaptic connections within the brain and after that it starts pruning and it will eliminate those connections that do not allow it to survive in its environment mm -hmm. so you might start with a pretty open mind blank slate but then whoops that got me hit that help didn't work, you know. So yeah. all the way through childhood, the brain will literally hardwire itself to that which allows it to survive in its environment. Right. There is brain science here. I wish to briefly repeat, summarize what you say. That that uh, it really not only up six years old, but then again in, in adolescence, the brain prunes the synaptic connections of things that don't work or of capabilities that are not used also. And so some of the empathic capabilities can be taken down or taken out, lose it or use it. And some have windows of opportunity. Yeah. So if it didn't get installed in, say, between the year two and four, it's almost impossible to do it later. So if it didn't get installed between the year two and four, it's, I mean, there's critical periods. Right. If one doesn't really master language by the time one becomes an adolescent by what time one hits puberty. It's a, it's a very high bar. It's a very high bar. I mean, so there are examples of feral children who are raised outside of civilization, and, and there's some celebrated cases. And it's, but, you know, and so we know, 
our knowledge and understanding are fraught and very limited. It's very risky to generalize. Now, here's the generalization. If you don't get a, use a certain capability by the end of the critical period, often it turns out to be puberty. It's going to be orders of magnitude harder, if ever. For the corrective so, emotional experience. You know, now, thank you, a corrective emotional Now, I noticed the, the fine uh, lady there in white. <laughs> She's so fine. been waiting. Yes, I was just wondering in your research if um, there was any correlation between empathy and intuition. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what's the correlation between empathy and intuition? And it's, a, you know, so here the short answer is um, intuition is a good guess. Intuit often, oftentimes intuition is an inference based on clues. So define your, our terms, right? I'm going to define our terms. But you may have a different definition. So one definition that has been proposed is that intuition is making an inference based on clues, whereas empathy is having a vicarious experience of the other's experience and processing that further cognitively. So in that sense, they're not quite opposite, but people who are very intuitive can train and train and find that some of their intuition gets transformed into empathy as they learn to not make snap judgments, as they learn to be quiet with the other person and let the other person do their thing, whether it's spout or do whatever they're doing, and then get where they're at and respond on that base. Not that intuition can't be useful and powerful. I can see, now this is not about you, I can see by the scar, the little barely visible scar on your face, and a slightly asymmetrical smile that you may have been in a serious automobile accident. That would be a wild guess. Whereas if I sit down and talk to the person, it may be true. Sometimes these wild guess, sometimes these things are true. It turns out that that wasn't, or not, you know, or, you know, I don't know, they hit their face on the dining room table pretending to fly, right, when they were six years old. So don't be too sure you know what's going on, right? So that, in that sense, so that's what, how I understand. So it's a, it's a, Oftentimes, if you tra if you when where training and empathy is being quiet and introspecting, what is my reaction to the other, and that tells me something about me first of all, but then it also might tell me something about the other, what, whereas they also are telling me something about themselves, right? I'm having a reaction to their story. It's making me angry, or it's making me sad, or it's making me, you know, I'm identifying, or I'm reacting negatively, or I'm saying yes. Oftentimes we have devaluing judgments. It, I mean, actually, that doesn't go away. It has to be separated. It has to be split off, and then it starts to shrink. It can be, sh it can be shrunk. I, I'm, this is just, you know, once again, not the truth. But oftentimes there's like a lot of judgment and evaluation going on. We, we do that often. And, you know, it's what it's like, so work on it, right? I mean, that's the assignment. Wait, Fred. There's a, there's a couple questions. Yeah, I'm going to do the first one real quick in response to yours. Was Sherlock Holmes empathetic? You know, I'm a big fan. I mean, as a, as, right? yeah, as a young man, I read Conan Doyle, so I'm playing, you know, and then I saw the very, some of the TV series. Well, he was, I mean, in the one representation, he's practically autistic. He's on the spectrum, right? I mean, and he's a brilliant, you know, he's a brilliant in, into, intuitive person. So that would be no, you know. Which is what you're, yeah. So you're able to see the clues, yeah. but not necessarily feel or think as but the other. Know, but there, I, are that, there is that cognitive element yeah. that he works his way through that, you know, the fact that, that you haven't shaved very well and you walked out means that somewhat your wife may not be looking at you that closely anymore because she let you go out. Yeah, yeah. There's a story in Holmes that way and, and you know your shirt collar is there so your marriage is... And, and he's thinking that through very clearly yes. using some of the, the observable clues. My second okay. question that comes in there is looking and fixating on that about the learnability of that. Yeah. Has anybody seen the, the, the Netflix series Lie to Me? Excellent series. Very interesting because it, it, what it is is a scientifically trained individual looking at the muscles on the face yeah. 
to see whether the muscles like there is actually uh, representing what the inner feeling are. And, and so it's a, he's like a forensic psychologist or something like that who's examining witnesses or examining suspects, what they say and their facial clues of those 30 odd muscles. Yes, or yes. Is that what you're, you're meaning? Yes. I, I mean, I think the short end, yes. trained to be empathetic. Yeah, I mean, that's some of that. I think that, that's the top down. I mean, that's what Paul Ekman is doing, right? Okay. And, and, and so I've got to check out that show. I mean, it's not. But I'm doing. Ekman extensively. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, it, one of the things about the show is it really creeps my wife out. It's <laughs> creepy. She can't do that anymore because yeah. then she can't feel she's fully empathetic with someone else because she gets the clues to distinguish and, and a little obscure. Well, but the guy on the left is yeah. a false smile, the one on the right is correct. Is That's a true smile. Yeah. Right? Well, that's a rather good. The true smile's on the right, that's yeah. a B. Yeah. Uh, um, here's the thing I would say to keep in mind for a, in relation to empathy. We don't really know what's going on. Is he lying or is she lying because he feels guilty? because he really did it, because he's innocent and is afraid of being falsely accused. Many people who are innocent and have survived something, something difficult, are afraid of falsely being accused, so they're stressed. They give the stress something. So Ekman is very clear on that, and I want to emphasize that. Doesn't, you know that some, there's some deception, something doesn't line up, but to find out, you have to talk to the person. There's no other way to find out. And so that and moves beyond intuition or the sort of scientific reading of the yeah. case to the openness to empathy. That's yeah, what thank you. I mean, that's, I think that's, pretty, that's very, very nice. Very In the nice. vocabulary of lie to me, the micro-expressions always give them away. We find out if they're guilty or not based on the micro-expressions. Well, that's right. That's the micro it's, it's a yes or no. In the well, that's the delicacy of empathy, right? I mean, that's the, the, you know, the rust in the taste of the sherry or the, the taste of leather. It's the, the micro-everything. There's the money, you know, it's like there's a growth industry now, actually. You know, I hope I'm contributing here. Um, and, and so, I mean, you're all well, I mean, and, and Elizabeth, you're up next, and unless anybody else has any, you know, I'll, please. Uh. Yeah, I'm kind of wrestling with the concepts of intuition and, and reading the facial muscles and thinking about talking to an artist and talking to um, um, students about art and, and, and people writing stories and sort of putting the whole thing together in terms of life as uh, all these things as metaphors for life. So if I'm studying what empathy is, if I'm reading facial twitches, if I'm, if I'm doing all this, I'm not um, creating in the moment. Um, I'm not in relationship with you. I'm in psychological positioning or something um, and if, if I'm with you I also realize that the other person is me so if you're struggling I'm struggling and and I'm gonna I'm gonna intuit that without manipulating um, and reading everything I think um, the focus on dissecting everything is is losing the art of being Okay, I mean the the, the, the contribution is um, you know, there's a narrative, and one can overthink and overintellectualize. That's, yeah, that's kind of like a para, not a fair paraphrase, but I'm trying. If I pick up a if I pick up a paintbrush or if I pick up a, yeah. a, a pen and I'm going to yeah. begin a story, I don't necessarily know where it's going to go, nor do I know where this painting is going to yeah. go, and nor do I know what this where this relationship is going to go. So if I if I over dissect and analyze, I'm sort of muscling it into a direction that I believe it, it needs to go in, as opposed to, as you said before, sitting back and giving the space for it to yeah. evolve. Agreement. I mean, there's widespread agreement. And, and the challenge is really not to do what I'm doing, is to spout and react, you know, intuitively, immediately, right? I mean, it's kind of the, the suck of the game at the moment. Nevertheless, to really give the other person as you say, the space and the um, room to kind of get out of the way of the other person and let him or her be who they are. And that shows you something. It shows you who they are. I mean, it's really a, quite a gift and quite a powerful thing when it works, which it often does. 
And so, you know, so I want to, at this moment, I, you know, to acknowledge we're actually five minutes I'll past the 7.30. Now, I, we have not drunk all the wine yet. <laughs> and I'm not committed to staying until we do. I may have another glass. I have plenty of time. I know, you know, I defer to you, Fred, in terms of the logistics, because I've never been here. But I'm going to stay a little longer. Yeah, you, but you all have permission to do what you need to do. I mean, the, the session is officially... Yes. Complete. I, and I thank you profusely. One of the things we're doing with this sort of conversation series is to introduce uh, and see. Uh, I've never seen you teach before. Yeah. I uh, and to sort of test this. Is there interest? Uh, is there ability? Is that and looking tonight at not only the philosophical but also the scientific understanding combined. I think uh, we need to have a course this fall in empathy. Uh, so look ahead. Uh, if, uh, I think that's what you're doing. Yeah, so, this was his audition, let's yeah. say. Uh, and, and I think he passed the audition. Well, I'm so, honored. So, I'm so uh, happy. Uh, I'm happy. Look forward to, to the continuing conversation. We have a little more time. Yeah. We have the room. But but uh, uh, so feel free. Lou yeah, let's. Said, I mean, I wish to. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Fred, and thank you, one and all. I got a lot of friends here. It's so heartwarming to see you all. I mean, and you're one of them. And, you know, you might have a lot of hogs, you know, we can... You may want to... Well, you can't get it, uh, Amazon. Luke? If we get Luke? together, I can bring you some. Luke? Can we'll get together. Yeah, I can't get it for you. I know, he may want to turn off his... Uh,